Hi everyone, we're coming to you live from the Cushman & Wakefield booth at ICSC Recon 2019 to bring you what's next in retail. I'm Alana Leffler, Head of Marketing for our America's Retail Services platform at Cushman & Wakefield, and with me this morning is Mike O'Neill, Executive Managing Director, Retail Services based in New York. Hi Mike, how are you? I'm great, thanks so much for having me. All right, well how's your conference going this year? Uh, it's been uh, it's been very good. Um, we're now uh, almost uh, almost two full days into to being at the convention center, uh, and a lot of us got started um, Saturday and and with meetings into Sunday. Uh, you know, I've generally found uh, the environment to be to be busy, busy, um, good amount of energy, and uh, so far uh, seems to be productive. That's great. I'm glad you're having a good time. Um, ICSC has some new elements this year they're incorporating. They've got the Innovation Exchange again for the second year in a row, fo focusing on technology. They have the Retail and Focus with emerging brands. Um, and then they've also got the Health and Wellness Pavilion, which is a focus on healthcare and retail. Um, so a lot of interesting things. Have you been able to see any of the panel sessions? I have not seen any of the, the panel sessions as of yet, but, but definitely um, a focus on innovation has been clear. Um, a focus on uh, really a, a lot of the, the changes that are impacting our industry um, are very clear in the content that ICSC is pushing out. Uh, it's clear in the in the conversations you know we're having throughout the day with both both retailers and and landlords. Um, and I, I think it's 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 good and healthy for everyone to acknowledge that um, our industry is in the midst of some significant disruption. Um, as always, disruption creates opportunity, uh, and I think you're seeing that, um, and you're seeing um, brands and, and certain uh, forward-thinking landlords and developers get out in front of that. Um, so, and I, I think it's good that that um, kind of some of these challenges are acknowledged, and some of the opportunities being created out of out of them are acknowledged as well. Absolutely. So let's talk about the live work play trend that's taking shape all across the U.S. in different cities. Um, there's a lot of new mixed use destinations that are coming up. Um, what elements do developers need to think about in creating a real retail destination that's successful? Um, it's, it's a really good question because um, the, the mall shopping center or retail environment that was relevant five years ago, 10 years, 15 years ago, is it's just not relevant in, in today's environment. Um, so I think there, there, there are a handful of items you, you need to create that successful environment today. Um, one, I think you have to have elements uh, that are unique. So you have to offer, um, you have to offer stores, opportunities that are different from what you'd find in a, in a prototypical environment. Um, and that can come in the form of actual brands. Um, Hudson Yards is a good example where they have some, some true first to market brands. It can come in the form of kind of pushing retailers um, who are established and quote unquote legacy brands to do something different uh, within that store. Um, so I think, I think unique elements within you know, new brands and, and existing brands are key. Um, I also think having uh, elements that will drive frequency is, is really important. Um, a very kind of obvious um, component of that is food and beverage. Um, and I think you, you've, seen, you've seen that really embraced in the mall and shopping center environment. If you look at the percentage of food and beverage today compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, it is up significantly. So I think unique um, you know, frequency are, are, are definitely key elements that uh, landlords and developers need to be looking at to create a successful environment. Absolutely, and talk about more um, the curation of F and B and and how that's affecting shoppers. You know what they're looking for when they're um, you know in those elements. So I think in, in a lot of ways, um, food and beverage has become almost almost an anchor to an extent. And if you look at the way some of your your typical anchor boxes are being reimagined, um, they're often involving food and beverage, kind of entertainment type elements, sometimes co-working um, as, as well. Um, so I think the role has become completely different, whereas at a point, food and beverage was seen as kind of a necessary evil. Now it's being seen as something that will in drive frequency, um, create create a destination where people will go throughout you know throughout the day. So you're you're capturing kind of a larger swath of time than a than a prototypical. Um, and and it it also, if done right, creates something that people will will come back to with with frequency. Um, so I think that role is is really significant. And do you have any um, good examples of who's doing that well? Uh, yeah, I think I, I do think um, I think Hudson Yards is a good example. Um, 
And if, if you were to communicate with the people from Related, they would tell you that um, their vision when it started did not involve as much food and beverage as they ultimately executed on. So I, I think that is a, a, a good, very recent example. Uh, they're also one that has embraced kind of these new brands and, and providing something different. Um, I think Century City, a, a development by what was Westfield, now you know, by Redampco in, in LA, was also one that really in food, uh, infused um, you know, food and beverage, kind of market concepts, as well as um, you know, your, your prototypical retail done in a smart, innovative way that that, um, you know, that has been successful. Yep, absolutely. And you were talking about these emerging brands that Hudson Yards has. I know they have a whole floor of these types of digitally native brands. Um, what are some examples of some cool concepts you've seen recently? Um, so I, I think some, some um, interesting newer examples include um, Roan, Mack Weldon, uh, Beta, um, the, the, those, are, those are three that are well represented in, um, in Hudson Yards. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, still a continued push among um, kind of that first phase of digitally native brands, whether it's it's Bonobos continuing a, a strong push, Warby Parker, Untuck It, um, you look at Marine Layer, um, all, all great examples of brands that are digitally native brands um, that are, are, you know, growing their um, brick and mortar presence uh, and growing their, their online presence as well. Um, so, I, and I think you'll, you'll see that trend continue. Yep, absolutely. And so I will ask you one question. Looking into the future, if you had a crystal ball, what would be the next step for these brands? I think you just mentioned a few brands that have kind of gotten out there. They've started expanding on the ground with their bricks and mortar. A few that are just beginning, but the ones that have already established themselves, like Bonobos, Warby Parker, Marine Layer, what's their next step? What do they do with the data now that they're collecting as it relates to on the ground and, and uh, clicks? So I think there's there's a couple elements. One, it's creating kind of that that right balance between um, between the the online business and the brick and mortar business. And and I think balance is something a lot of these brands are, are trying to uh, trying to achieve. So I think that's that's that is one piece of the equation. Um, the the other the other opportunity I think, and to your point. They are armed with a tremendous amount of data which can inform that decision making process. And as the stores get more mature, um, they're going to continue to aggregate even more data. Um, un initially, a lot of those decisions were fueled by the, on the online customer behavior. The, the, the in-store customer behavior is going to be different. So I think they will continue to get smarter, uh, make better decisions. Um, and, and I also think just thinking about overall opportunity, um, I think for a lot of these brands, um, the international landscape provides um, a, a, an opportunity for truly a new geography where there's opportunity. And I think you'll start to see um, those brands as they kind of move through the U.S. and, and I want to say saturate the U.S., but um, as, they, as they're growing in the U.S., I think internationally will be another opportunity as well. Yep, and I think as they grow into different markets, they truly get to understand their audience better and better. So when they do go overseas, they know exactly who they're targeting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you know, l like in you know different uh, domestic geographies, the customer behaves differently, um, you know, in in New York than they do in LA versus Austin. And I think that that potential change in customer behavior is, is going to be exacerbated um, you know, as, you, as you move into um, you know, other countries internationally. So those steps will probably um, need to be taken in a you know, measured and methodical manner. I think that what we've learned over the course of this last few years in transition is um, there is more opportunity for, call it flexible term, and that's a great way to kind of test markets. And I think that's, that is a logical way that you'll see some of these brands um, start to look at international expansion as well. Absolutely, great. Well, thank you, Mike. This was really insightful. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you, you as well. Always, always a pleasure. Great. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Check back as we bring you live from Cushman and Wakefield's booth at ICSC Recon 2019. I'm Alana Leffler. And that